please uh, bow your head and pray with me. God of Abraham and God of ours today, you truly are worthy of our praise. You are king, sovereignly reigning and ruling over our nation, over our world, over our very lives. You are eternal, having no beginning and no end. You are love, loving your people with the love that is broad and long and high and deep. You are the great I am, the only true God, the one alone who deserves our worship. You are perfectly powerful and you are perfectly wise. You are our provider, our protector, and our sustainer. You are full of grace and full of mercy. You are our forgiver. You are our redeemer. You are holy, holy, holy. You are utterly unique. There is no God like you. You are consistent. You can be counted on. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You are our heavenly Father, our good shepherd, and our friend. You are our triune God, one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that by faith we could be reconciled to you, so that by faith we could be transformed from being your enemies to being your children. For these reasons and many more, we humbly bow down this day to worship you in spirit and in truth. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his very first disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now using the Apostles' Creed to declare uh, what we believe in common. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
continue to worship as we sing together Psalm 105, Give Thanks to God. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to this portion of your word in the book of Deuteronomy, we thank you for it in advance. We thank you for the encouragement it gives us in regards to the renewing of the covenant and the call that you make upon parents in that regard. Father, we pray that as we read it, that the enemy who would seek to bring condemnation and remind of failures would be vanquished, but that your word would come in renewing power and help us to live out in joyful obedience every call that you make upon our life, convinced that it is for our good always. In Jesus' name, amen. Reading in the familiar portion of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, first 12 verses and then pick up at verse 20. The book of Deuteronomy literally means the second giving of the law, the second time around. The Ten Commandments first appear in Exodus and then they are renewed as the covenant is renewed. That's what Deuteronomy is about. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, 
that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our our good always." that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all the commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. In our passage this morning, we have a record of Moses exhorting Israel to obey the commandments of the Lord. Why did the law have preeminence? Why should it be obeyed? Because obedience meant life. The result of obedience is that we will fear the Lord, verse 2, and that that He will help us to then keep His commandments. There's two strong emotions that come forth uh, in the passage, uh, fear and love. Fear the Lord is mentioned in verse 2, verse 13, verse 24. Love the Lord, the greatest of all the commandments, is mentioned in verse 5. And though at first that may seem contradictory, fear the Lord and love the Lord, they are actually closely related. And the fear of the Lord has to do with a sense of great reverence and respect and awe over God as our Creator and our Redeemer. And the more we understand Him at that level of both mind and heart, we grow in an awe of His sovereign Lordship. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? A lot. Why do we go to Niagara Falls? It's awesome. We just go to see it. And if you have children, what do you tell them? Don't get too close. Because it's dangerous also. Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. Haven't been there. But I've Googled it. And there's a place right at the edge of the falls called the Devil's Pool. And you can go wade out in that off of Livingstone Island. And the water is rushing off the falls by you. A 354-foot drop. It's over a football field in, in length. And you can lay out in the pool and just look over the falls. And I say you, because I'm not going to do that. (laughs) But you can do that if you want to. And people pay good money to do that. But it's awesome, and it draws people there, and there is a love and an appreciation for the majesty of it and a fear. 
the danger of it. Regarding God, it requires the knowledge that God first loved us, and He has our interests at heart, and He has the right to command our love for Him, and He does that, and the keeping of the commands is a tangible expression of our obedience to God in both fear and love, this utter reverence and love for God. The phrase, hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, is found often in the book of Deuteronomy. It carries out Moses' recurring theme to obey and be blessed. Now, it doesn't say obey and be saved, because the law was never intended to be a, a track of obedience. Do these things, check the list, and be saved. The law was always intended to show, here's the list. This is what holiness looks like. You don't make it. You fall short. You need a Redeemer. You need a Messiah. That's what it was intended to show us from the beginning. And then having been redeemed, the law becomes our friend to guide us in how we are to live in a way that honors God. But it's how we live after what God has done for us, not to make a way of salvation. If we get the law turned around on that, we will be forever striving and losing. And then we'll miss the blessing that's intended here so clearly. The blessing lies before the children, the land flowing with milk and honey. So what do we need to know? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That there is one true God. In the midst of the land they were going into with the worship of many gods, Throughout the world in those ancient times, the worship of many gods, but there is one God. The idea of oneness in Deuteronomy 5, there's one law, there is one mediator, continues in Deuteronomy 6 that there is one Lord. And the Apostle Paul sums that up. We heard it in the call to worship from Ephesians 4 today, that there is one Lord, one faith, One baptism, one God and Father of all. There's one true God. And since there is only one God, it makes sense that God should be loved completely. We don't have to spread our love around amongst various gods. There is one God that we are to love with all our heart, all our mind, all our might. And so, verse 5 is central to the book of Deuteronomy. Indeed, verse 5 is central to the entire Bible. This command to love is paramount because the whole book is concerned with renewing the covenant. The covenant was an expression of God's love for His people, calling them to Himself. But it was a covenant that demands an obedience. An obedience that is best seen in love for God. E.W. Nicholson, an Old Testament scholar from England, uh, just died a few years ago, said it's in a very real sense true to say that the entire book of Deuteronomy is a commentary on the command at the beginning, you shall love the Lord your God. The rest of Deuteronomy is talking about that. Then he goes on to say this, A national law can never attain its goal as long as it is applied only by compulsion. It must be founded on the inward assent of the people. When God gives us command, there is also the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. When national government makes a decree and says we will force it only by compulsion, we don't care what you think. It can never, never, never attain its goal. St. Augustine advised this way, Love God and do as you please. Love God and do as you please. He got it. If you're loving God, and that is your heartbeat, then the things you please will not be contrary to God. So love God and do as you please. He will guide us along the way in that. Because the law tells us what to do, but it cannot empower us to do it. 
but the love of God in our hearts empowers us and motivates us with the desire to do it. It makes all the difference in the world. The exhortation to love God is found ten times in Deuteronomy. It is the Shema, the basic and the essential creed of Judaism. It's used to open a service of worship. It is the first words memorized by a Jewish child if they're memorizing Scripture, the Shema. Jesus said that Deuteronomy 5 is the first and greatest commandment, that our love for God involves our heart, our soul, our might. Last week, we read that the early Christians gathered in the homes as they would worship God, and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, and prayer. They were devoted, heart, soul, and might. God's people, we are to be growing in a love for God that increasingly dominates our emotions. It directs our thoughts, taking every thought captive, as Paul would write. It's the motivating power of our actions And this degree of love will be evident before God. It will be evident before other people. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment uh, from Matthew 22, verses 37 and 8. This command, given through Moses and then emphasized by Jesus, is to be diligently taught, diligently observed. Verses 6 through 9 in our passage. So let's say this. A person must experience the love of this command requires before we can teach it to others. We must experience this love before we can teach it to others. Note the preeminence here of the heart, both in Moses and then in Jesus. The external actions alone, talking, binding, the signs... The external actions are not a substitute for the inner work of the Spirit of God in our hearts. But when the commandment is cradled in our hearts, it becomes increasingly obvious in our conversations and in our actions. Again, St. Augustine was asked, what does love look like? What does love look like? He replied, it has hands to help others. It has feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It has eyes to see the misery and want. It has ears to hear the sighs and sonnets of men. That's what love looks like. Love and truth are best taught when first received by the teacher. The externals are not enough. Trying to obey this, devout Jews would make phylacteries with passages from Exodus and Deuteronomy, and they would bind it on their arm to be close to their heart. They would bind it uh, on their foreheads to keep it before their eyes. They would put it on the doorpost of their homes and to the entrances. Jesus talks to the Pharisees about that, and he kind of gets on them about it, not because they were doing that. That was fine, but that's where it stopped the externals. He's saying if it just stops with the externals, if you have on the doorpost of your house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, that's a great declaration as long as it doesn't stop there at the doorpost. We're called to instill it and to enact it and to live it out. That's what Jesus was saying here. So we have to have this in our heart. Covenant responsibility for worship in the home, because we're continuing this series on worship, begins with personal worship of the Lord. How long can a father or a mother or a grandparent or for that matter a pastor minister to others without being refilled themselves? How long can you do it? Well, that'll vary with different ones of us. But it's not endlessly. Ministering to and with family. Here's the mental picture for me. You can minister out of the cup or you can minister out of the saucer. 
All right, we use mugs now. You get more coffee in a mug. But in a cup and saucer, right, which do you minister out of? If you fill up the cup and it overflows into the saucer and you're ministering out of the saucer, you're ministering out of the overflow of God's grace, of the things coming into your life as the Spirit of God is at work. And there's always extra there. And then there will come crucial times and difficult times and seasons where things get busy or hectic and crazy, and you will be ministering from the cup as well. And you can do it because your cup is filled. But if you keep doing that, and it's not refilled, what happens? Well, we call it burnout. We run out. God doesn't intend for that. And so we, we need to invest time and our personal walk with God through reading His Word and thinking on His Word and prayer and, and worship, and including singing to the Lord. We live in a culture that says image is everything, perception is everything, how it looks is what matters. But if we keep ministering until we're dry, even the image doctors can't fix it. At least not before God. He won't be fooled. And eventually, not before others as well. We run out. The only way I know to keep one's own cup full overflowing so that you have ministry from the overflow is to continue to go before the Lord. And to know that He will meet you. There's a song, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. Personal worship is the beginning then of this covenant responsibility. Parents and grandparents, individually, we, we need that ongoing filling. If you're on an airplane and and the emergency oxygen drops, you don't want to be on that airplane. But if it does, what do they tell you to do? Get your oxygen first so that you can care for those around you that are your responsibility. If you take care of them first, you might pass out. You might run out of gas, literally, O2, before you can take care of them. And so personal worship is a responsibility of ours. At the end of the service in the narthex and in the north foyer, there's a family worship guide for FBCLP. It has application for personal worship and then for family worship. I encourage you to take one. Take two or three if you have people you want to share it with to encourage them in that. So the, the personal worship is where it begins so that we have something to share, but the commandment is not automatically transferred from one generation to another. It is a covenant responsibility to pass it on and to be diligent in that. The home is to be the center for conserving and, and propagating truth. Somebody has said, home is where life makes up its mind. Home is where life makes up its mind. Moses understood that the greatness of the nation of Israel depended upon the teaching of the commandments in the home. As a nation, we desperately need to apply this truth ourselves. The church of Jesus Christ needs to apply this truth. The Greek philosopher Socrates lived long before Jesus was not a Christian, was not a Hebrew. But he wrote this, Fellow citizens, why do you turn and scrape every stone to gather wealth and take so little care of your children to whom one day you must relinquish it all? He got it, even for different reasons. The instruction from the parents to the children was not to be only a lesson, it was to be continuous as a, a way of life, saturating the children with these important commandments. They were to experience them, talk about them, exhibit them, write them, and most importantly, model them. See, Moses understood that 
once they settled in the land in Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey, that they would have difficulty living totally for God. Unfortunately, there's often often a, a negative correlation between God's favor and human gratitude. Verses 11 and 12 say, these blessings, he warns, can lead to their downfall. And when you eat and are full, verse 11, then take care lest you forget the Lord, verse 12. Haven't you found it true that serious thinking precedes genuine thinking? That we need to be thinking and mindful of God's blessings and our children need to know that the blessings that they enjoy are blessings from the hand of God. The Apostle Paul saw this and wrote in Romans, the first chapter, although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans one twenty one. They were not thankful. They forgot God. And then they became futile in their thoughts and foolish in their hearts. Abundance has a a tendency to produce arrogance. That idea surfaces several times throughout Deuteronomy. With our limited vision, we sometimes fail to see our spiritual inadequacies when our other personal needs are being met. We become self-reliant rather than God-reliant, or increasingly in our day, government-reliant instead of God-reliant. And yet there's much that neither ourself nor our government is able to do. And to the degree that we or the government or any other entity seeks to stand in for God, they cannot help but fail. Often, and certainly eventually, the fall will be spectacular. Forgetting the Lord is the first peril which prosperity leads us to if we are not mindful, deliberately mindful of the Lord. Notice that Moses gives no credence to the idea that covenant children should just be left to figure life and faith out for themselves. Living amongst the Canaanites, they're going to somehow just pick up that hero Israel, the Lord is one. They don't believe that. Parents have, then and now, a covenant responsibility to instruct, to train, to encourage, and to grow our children in the faith. Let me ask this. Would you, at dinner time, just say to your child, eat whatever you want. And when you get to a certain age, you can decide for yourself whether vegetables are going to be a part of your diet. Cake and ice cream, whatever you want. This this should be your choice. Would you say, watch whatever you want on TV? When you get older, you can decide for yourself what things you want to cut out. Video games? What about friends? Do you speak into their life? I'm not sure. That's a good friend for you to have. No, you can't go to their house. Yes, they can come over to our house. You can't go to their house. No, go anywhere you want. Stay out as late as you want. Doesn't matter. One day you'll need to make a choice about what's right for you. Why would we do this? All those things are going to pass away. They're material. They're of a timely nature. But that which is of an eternal nature, their faith, their relationship with God, Often we've gotten it built in. Well, I'm not going to force this on them. Is God less important than a vegetable? Really? But force it? No. Absolutely not. This doesn't say force it on them. It says instruct them. Teach them. Help them to know the joy of the Lord. But if they're not experiencing the joy of the Lord with you, they're probably not going to know the joy of the Lord. That's it. It's a covenant responsibility, but it's a covenant joy 
as well. Family worship helps to accomplish that. There's another part of this instruction. It falls, first of all, God says, to the fathers of the home. First of all, that's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. That's where it lands first. What about if the father isn't in the home? There isn't a father in the home. What if the father isn't a believer? Well, then it falls to a godly mother, and it becomes one more thing on their plate. And godly moms do it. But if there's a Christian father in the home, that's a place for you to take the lead. You take the lead. And for single parents, pray for them. They've got it all on their plate every single day. It's exhausting. It can be a thankless task. So pray for them and encourage them in this. Verses 20 to 25, Moses reminds his people of their crucial need to pass on the covenant truths, promises, and values to their children. It wasn't intended for one generation only. And he knew that the children were bound to inquire sooner or later about why their parents live the way they do. Verse 20, when your son asks you in the time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes and the rules? He expected them to ask questions. Haven't you noticed that children kind of naturally are inquisitive? What's the favorite question of a little child? Why? Yeah. Why do we go to church? We're told to be ready to answer that. To encourage them in that. To help them get the picture of why we do that. One of the memories stuck in my mind is waking up one Lord's Day to a flooded house. The water heater had gone kaput. I thought we were going to miss church. Dad said, get ready for church. I said, what about all this water? He said, it'll be here when we get back. And it was. That's stuck in my mind. This passage gives excellent insight into our responsibilities as parents in educating our children. But we find insight for family worship, which is one of the ways we incorporate it together. So a couple of things here. Encourage your children to ask questions, verse 20. We want them to ask questions. Stories told about a, a dad and his son, a small son, walking along, uh, taking a walk together, and they pass this unusual-looking truck, and the boy said, Daddy, what's that? And he said, I don't know. Well, they walked on, and they came to this old-fashioned warehouse, and, and he said, Daddy, what's in there? He goes, I don't know. He walked on, and there was a man working with a jackhammer, a pneumatic drill, and he said, Daddy, what's that man doing? I don't know. So they walked on a little bit further in silence, and he said, Daddy, do you mind me asking all these questions? And he said, certainly not. How else are you going to learn anything? <laughs> we want to teach them. We want to teach them. The, the one boy grumbled that, you know, the first they teach you to talk, and then they teach you to walk, and then they tell you to sit down and be quiet. We want to encourage. Thank you. We want to encourage. We want to encourage those questions. And then explain your answers thoroughly, verses 21 through 23. He would talk, said, walk them through what the Lord has done for you. There was a time when we were enslaved in Egypt. The Lord, through His mighty arm and His goodness to us, delivered. Tell them the story of redemption. Well, what about us as Christians? You tell them the story of redemption. That we were once enslaved to sin. But God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. He sent Jesus into the world. And all the law that we find hard and we, we mess up on, Jesus kept it perfectly. And then he gave his life. He went to the cross. He paid with his own life. The wages of sin is death. Jesus paid that. And through his death and then his resurrection overcoming death, through faith in him, we have forgiveness of our sins. But more than that, we have righteousness from God. 
Remember, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. We tell the story, and we tell it again, and we tell it again, and we tell it again, and we don't get tired of telling it. In fact, we are filled up and renewed as we tell the story again. And then verse 21 through 25, ex- emphasize God's intent. It's for our good. They need to be taught. Children need to hear. We need to be reminded that every command and every action of God is, verse 24, for our good always. God's loftiest goal is not to show off, not to, that we would just be astounded by His power. He uses that to draw us All his attributes draw us to himself, that God's very best plan for our lives would be manifest. Victoria Falls in its awesomeness draws people to venture to hang out over it, to take it in as much as possible. God draws us into this relationship with him. And notice the phrases that illustrate God's desire. For our good always, verse 24, the the Lord brought us out of Egypt. The Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive and it will be righteousness for us. And so Moses encouraged this ongoing recital of God's deliverance of his people. So they would remember and so that the children would not only know God, but also love God and obey God. And not because they had to, but because they want to. And then, exhort your children in righteous living. The result of living the, learning the Lord's commands is then living the Lord's commands. And it will be righteousness for us. We don't teach our kids, be careful in this. We are not want to exhort them to do this so that you will have heaven. No. First is God's deliverance, the whole gospel story. But because of that, he calls you to live righteously. In every part of life with moral conduct and and integrity and concern for others. Recalling the gospel story with our children helps them to understand our forgiveness and the imputation of God's righteousness through Christ and that the rest of our life is growing up in that, learning it, applying it. In a word, sanctification. We want them to know that. Obedience to God grows us in righteousness. And so Moses stresses here that parents are to love God with all their heart, all their soul, all their might, so that we can teach our children that same love for God. It's a covenant responsibility, and it's a covenant joy. We need it throughout the week. We need to be instructing our children. Every Lord's Day, after I preach, one of the things I do is I have to go take the batteries here and stick them in there to recharge. If I don't, next week this thing is not going to work or it's going to fail sometime in the sermon. They have to be freshly charged. But this, I have to charge every day. This I'm using once a week. This I use every day. To do what Moses calls us to do. If we try to live out our faith every day of the week and only get charged once a week, no wonder. No wonder we get weak. And so we're to charge daily. As we come before the Lord, He meets us and He fills our cup. He fills us up. And He calls us to walk with Him. 
our life and walk with God corporately with the body of Christ, the church, and personally and as a family in the Word of God and praying and singing. It's a covenant responsibility, but it leads to covenant joy. And I pray we would discover that again, rejoice in that, and grow in that. And I hope this guide, you'll pick that up and it will help you also. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the call that you have placed upon our life. We thank you for a story that really does never grow old. Help us to tell it afresh again and again. Help us to encourage our children to ask why and engage with them gladly for the glory of your name and for their eternal life and joy as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of response, A Christian Home. Let's sing together.
It's a great prayer for us as we practice our personal worship and encourage family worship. Encourage our children in that. My children are going to get a copy of this. I still remind them of things. What they do with it, I don't know. But I hope they'll take it to heart and consider it. Because it's joy that's being offered. Not dull drudgery. It's joy. It's joy. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you, bringing you joy, joy to share and to pass on for generations to come until Jesus comes again. Amen.